Top of day. Welcome everyone. The Committee on Health, Land, Justice and Culture is now called to order. Today is Thursday, February 25, 2021. The time is 4.08 p.m. We uh, issued notice for this public hearing via email to all senators and all main media broadcasting outlets on Thursday, February 18, and again on Tuesday, February 23rd, 2021. The notice was also published in the Guam Daily Post on Thursday, February 18, and Tuesday, February 23rd, 2021. Um, all of all, uh, all those who are present who would like uh, to speak uh, will first be recognized by the chair before speaking and please state your name for the record as often as you can just because of the setup that we have today is very difficult to determine who is speaking especially uh, in the room okay and um, all right so this is an informational briefing with the Guam Memorial Hospital Authority, the Board of Trustees Hospital, about the Board of Trustees Hospital plans and priorities. I'd like to acknowledge the presence of Senator Tello Taitagui, Senator Anthony Ada, Senator Chris Duenas, Senator Frank Ross Jr., and Senator Joanne Brown. Thank you, Senators, for being here today and, and for being uh, interested enough to, to tune into this uh, informational briefing. You know, I, yeah, I very much appreciate your time in, in, in committing to do this. I'd also, of course, like to thank the Board of Trustees for the Guam Memorial Hospital. Uh, several of them are here today, including, including, I think the chairperson could not be with us, but, um, well, if you could all introduce yourself, the trustees, to, to, to us, please. Well, okay, we've got the, um, Teresa Obispo is the chairperson, but I don't think she's with us today. Melissa Waybell, she's here on Zoom by herself. Sarah Thomas Nedida, Sarah. Wait, what happened to Sarah? Okay, she was here, she'll probably be back. Oh, there she is, Sarah. I'm Hi, Sarah, there you are. Sarah, and Sarah is joined in the same room with Sonia Siliang, who's also a trustee. Hi, Sonia. Hi. And uh, Byron Everisto, is he here? I don't think so. Okay, the other trustee is Sharon Davis, and she is here. Sharon, if you could wave your Hi. hand. Thank And um, Linus Almonte, I don't think she has joined us today. Dr. Michael Um, he's also a trustee. And there's Dr. Michael Um and Evangeline Allen. Thank you. All right, and so we. All right, and so we have, uh, of course, the GMH management team. They will be introducing themselves shortly. Uh, we've asked that um, they wanted they wanted to give an informational briefing on the hospital and update to the senators. I've asked them to also include current status of the CMS compliance to include pending items, status of capital improvement projects, particularly the EHR system implementation, the electrical panel, and the skilled nursing unit repairs. All right, and, and before we begin, um, they had a board meeting last night and I just want to follow up two items. There were two resolutions passed last night relative to increasing incentive pay for registered nurses and licensed practical nurses from 16 to 20 percent. Um, I was, I, I haven't received the copies yet and I was hope yeah, I was, I had asked for some so if I could follow up on the copies of those resolutions and um, yes and if if those resolutions, if, if they are passed, does that mean that that uh, will be implemented right away? I, I, I'm not able to read the resolutions, so I just want to know the effective date of those. It's effective on February 28th. Okay, great. All right, thank you. Um, okay, so now I will uh, recognize Sarah Thomas Nedida for, uh, to begin. Trustee Sarah? Yes, I'll just remove my mask a little bit so it'll be easier to hear. Hafade Buenas, uh, Speaker Terlahi, and Senators, thank you for this opportunity for the Guam Memorial Hospital 
board of trustees and our managers to meet with you to talk about the basically the state of affairs of our hospital. I know that you join us in being very concerned and very passionate about the progress that is being made and which there are quite a bit. And, um, you know, what are some of the plans and the, the vision of the board and the management of, uh, of the hospital? Uh, the rationale for this orientation is simply to bring us together so that um, we can start off this new year with, uh, I guess, a, a clearer understanding of uh, what the hospital, where the hospital is at in terms of its overall, you know, um, I think most people are concerned about the health and safety, of course, of the patients and the staff, but also the facilities and what's going on there. So today we will do an overview and a summary of what those plans are. And we would really love to establish a very close link with the Committee on Health, especially, and of course the, the legislature in its totality, so that as we move forward in this next term, we can move succinctly, we can uh, move together with, with a common vision. So we thought this, we actually thought about this last year even before the elections that we wanted to kick off this year, this new year in a much closer liaison and with greater communications um, and, of, and of course, forging that common vision always with, with the Guam legislature, because you're in fact, you're our partners. Uh, you know, we're just, we're excited for all of you that are, are on this committee we find that, you know, you're all very sincere and you are very concerned about the state of affairs of, of our public hospital. So that's really orientation to kick off uh, this year with uh, an overview of what's going on. And of course, to know the uh, members of the Committee of, on Health a little bit more and what some of your concerns and your thoughts are so that when we move forward for the rest of the year, like I said, we are more aligned. So please keep a open mind and an open heart as we get through today's agenda. I wanna especially acknowledge the management of Guam Memorial Hospital. I, I'll tell you, I've been on the board of trustees. I think it's going on is it two years now, uh, Trustee Sonia? And I've had such a wonderful experience with um, very dedicated professionals. I mean, they're truly professionals. And for those of you that know me, I'm an accreditation, you know, uh, I'm really very, very committed to the highest standards of services. And I feel so consoled and inspired every time I go to a, um, Guam Memorial Hospital uh, uh, board meeting. There's certainly things that we are still wrestling with. There's lots to do, never a boring moment, but certainly the dedication and professionalism of the staff is outstanding. And I'm joined by awesome board members. And I think that if you look at the history of the board of trustees in the last decade or so, I think you'll find that this, this cohort it, between the board and the managers um, are, are very conscientious. We haven't missed one meeting. We meet every single month. All of our committees are very active and they meet regularly. And there's a partnership with the board and the managers in all of these subcommittees from facilities and the, the subcommittee that I chair is governance, strategic planning, and bylaws. So constantly reflecting on those issues relative to governance as um, the other committees focus on their areas from human resources to, you know, again, facilities and some other areas. So we're pretty much an open book. Senators, please, please, uh, 
you know, listen to the presentations, and I know that you will, and ask those good questions. And there are things that you think about after uh, today's session. I hope that you'll feel very comfortable in contacting us and letting us know what those are. And if you're interested and able to come to any of our board meetings, uh, please do. I think it's a wonderful experience to attend a, um, a board of trustees meeting. So we welcome you and we thank you for this opportunity. Speaker, an acknowledgement to your staff and to your committee as well for um, coordinating and organizing tonight's session. We thank you for that. And um, of our apologies that our chair Teresa Bispo is not here with us uh, today. She has family issues that she has to contend with. And of course, that's first and foremost always. But Sir Sergio, they kind of popped uh, in a little bit at the beginning. But I know that I'm joined by several of our trustees. Uh, I have, of course, um, Trustee Sonia Cillian here with me. And um, I know that uh, uh, our vice chair, Melissa Weibel, is um, facilitating tonight's session. We have, um, we have Banji and, uh, and uh, uh, Dr. Ohm. And who else has joined us? For that? Sharon. Oh, uh, Sharon Davis. And we have a full board right now. There's nine, there's nine of us. So uh, the managers, uh, Madam Speaker, if it's not out of order, if I could ask that the managers uh, introduce themselves right now and uh, we can uh, go ahead and proceed uh, with our presentation. And again, I want to thank everyone for being here tonight, but most especially, um, we're really sincere when we say we want to hear what your um, observations and comments are. And if we can't get through them tonight, we certainly look for additional opportunities. And we hope, uh, uh, Madam Chair, Madam Speaker, that tonight is just the first of uh, several sessions that the Committee on Health will uh, convene with the uh, Guam Memorial Hospital Board of Trustees and Management. So thank you. We'll move on to the agenda. And I look forward to a wonderful uh, dialogue tonight. All right. Thank you. I'd also like to uh, in, um, recognize uh, some other senators who have joined us in addition to the ones I, I named earlier. We've got uh, the vice chair of our committee on health is Senator Sabina Paris. And we have Senator Mary Torres, who's also joined us. Thank you. And Senator Joanne Brown. And um, all right, and we are going to, and I just wanted to note that, so Sarah, um, trustee Sarah Thomas Nettedog is the chair of the subcommittee on governance, strategic planning and bylaws. All right, now we will hear from the boardroom. Uh, we were going to get an introduction of those in the boardroom, the, the management team. All right. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Speaker uh, Teresa Lani, for giving us this opportunity uh, to engage. I'm sorry. It, it, yeah, it, um, could, we're going to all have to introduce ourselves when we talk. Uh, is that the is that Lillian Posadas? Yes. We, okay. yes, ma'am. I'm sorry. Yeah. I forgot about that we, one. We were there. Yeah. They didn't mention that earlier. So, okay, great. I'm so glad you're there. Okay, wonderful. So Lillian, of course, is the administrator of the hospital. And so Lillian, yes, please introduce yourself and your team. Thank you. Yes, thank you so much. Again, as I would say, this is Lillian Posada. Thank you for this opportunity, uh, Speaker Therese, and also the senators. And thank you, uh, Trustee Sarah, for uh, initiating this uh, you know, meeting uh, with the uh, new legislature so that we can have this relationship um, and the communication with all that's going on between the hospital and what we can get them from the legislature in terms of assistance and support. And definitely, we are here uh, to then, you know, answer whatever questions and, and update you with whatever uh, information that you need. In the boardroom, I have Ms. Yuka Echernova. Uh, she is our CFO. Mr. William Kandu, Associate Administrative Operations. 
Mr. Don Ravenel, he is our Assistant Administrator for Administrative Services. And to his right is Ms. Christine Takaro. She is our Deputy uh, Assistant Nursing Administrator. To Christine's right is Ms. Bell Rada. She is our Assistant Administrator for Professional Support Services. Dr. Jolene Ogden, she is our COVID guru. And uh, Associate Administrator of Clinical Services. And we've got Dr. Um, Annie Bordali, our Medical Director and CMO. And also in her office, we have Danielle Mangalonia, who is our uh, Compliance, Regulatory Compliance Administrator. And we have Justine, who is our, uh, who helps us out with our, keeping us straight here with our, uh, with our communication on our meeting. So again, thank you so much for, for this opportunity. And so as uh, Trustee uh, Sarah mentioned, um, what we're going to talk about and what you had also uh, mentioned, the uh, Speaker Talahi to cover the CMS, the uh, resolution, the CIP, the HR, Electrical Panel, SNU. We're also going to talk about um, you know, the scope of services that we provide, our strategic plan, and our current snapshot of our calendar year 21, strategic goals, objectives, and milestones, uh, our COVID-19 response update, the financial posture and efforts towards achieving financial stability, which is in line with our strategic goals. Uh, any update updates on regulatory compliance with regards to accreditation, not necessarily joint, uh, the joint accreditation organization, but some kind of an accrediting, accrediting organization that we would like to pursue. Uh, the CMS, risk management and quality. Capital infrastructure, which you mentioned earlier, uh, in terms of the improvements that are aligned with the Army Corps of Engineer assessment that was done in 2018, I mean 2019, planning and development, uh, talking about the new hospital facility, the alternate care site, uh, which is the SNF. So that's what we're going to discuss, uh, present to you today. And uh, to begin, uh, in terms of the scope of services, the acute care that we provide, uh, medical surgical services, um, the emergency room, the intensive care unit, including the maternal child health area, which we serve as uh, you know, L&D, ob Ward, pediatrics, pediatric intensive care unit, um, the nursery, the skilled nursing uh, facility uh, that we provide, um, and right now we have those patients uh, as over at a offsite that we had to take them out uh, during the COVID as part of our response. We, have, we provide emergency and trauma care, special services such as cardiology, orthopedics, hand, EEG, urgent care. And in the cardiology department, uh, we also do... We, um, this is Bell Rada, the assistant administrator of professional support, Chairman, if I may add to cardiology. Uh, we do balloon and stenting, pacemaker, and other uh, cardiology procedures. With the exception of open heart. We With the exception care. of open heart, yes. Yeah. We also do, uh, we provide comprehensive inpatient and outpatient surgical services inpatient and outpatient diagnostic and therapeutic services, such as the rehab, physical therapy, occupational therapy, speech therapy. And we also have interventional radiology uh, that we provide. I'll hand over now to the next slide on the strategic plan to Mr. William Kander. Uh, good evening, uh, Speaker Terlahi and, uh, and Senators. Uh, good evening, uh, GMHA Board of Trustees uh, members. Thank you. Um, relative to our GMHA's uh, strategic plan, we have a five-year strategic plan that, uh, that goes from 2018 through 2022. Uh, within that strategic plan, our mission is to provide quality patient care in a safe environment. And our vision is to achieve a culture and environment of safety and quality patient care, meeting national standards and addressing the needs of the community in a physically responsible autonomous hospital. GMHA serves the Guam community uh, by following our core values, uh, which are accountability, cost efficiency, excellence in service, safety, plus quality. Strategic uh, goals, uh, we have five major strategic goals. They are to achieve uh, financial stability, uh, le uh, leadership, leadership team development, establish and sustain safety and quality culture, 
uh, training and education, assessment, development, and implementation, and capital improvement uh, planning and implementation to include facilities upgrades, capital improvement projects, and information technology enhancements. Uh, as we drill down and, and uh, focus specifically on calendar year 2021, we have 18 objectives, objectives that we're striving to uh, complete within this given year. Um, that, that's going to go through three, th three slides, the next three slides. So I'm not going to go into each of the 18. I'm just going to cover certain ones, especially those that um, uh, uh, align with our need to, to really collaborate with the, the legislature. Our number one is to achieve and sustain a successful uh, GMHA COVID-19 recovery throughout calendar year 21. Uh, so our completion date is the end of this year. Uh, we're doing it throughout the, uh, throughout the year. Our number three is complete and analyze the responses of the staff development and training needs assessment survey. And number four is full implementation and go live of the MedSphere CareView EHR project uh, by October of this year. On the next one, uh, next slide out, uh, number seven is implement an enhanced and implement an, an enhanced and robust revenue cycle management program to maximize capturing of income generating processes and services and monitor track cost saving opportunities. Dependent on uh, is, is dependent right now is on on the AG uh, AG's office their review and approval. We're working with the AG's office to bring this um, uh, RFP package uh, to cl to closure so that we can uh, implement the contract. We're getting very close. Number eight is finalize and secure uh, BOT approval of the hospital healthcare specific personnel rules and policies with emphasis on the standards of patient care for an acute care health healthcare facility. And this is dependent on the need for legislative approval. Uh, number 12, continue uh, collaborating with and engaging AGIDA to complete the conceptual design plan for the new hospital facility. And, uh, and so we'll be doing, we'll be engaging with the task, the, the team, Guam, team Guam's task force on that. And then hopefully we'll be, once we get it going, uh, we'll be meeting quite often with them, hopefully on a monthly basis. Uh, number 15, recruit and retain additional uh, and critical human resources for the divisions of clinical, physical operations and medical services. So as to reduce reliance on high cost off island travel, travel nurse staffing agencies. And uh, so we're, we're looking to, to uh, tighten down on this one by March, the end of March, and then monthly mm -hmm. thereafter. Uh, of course, this one is also dependent on, uh, on uh, COVID-19 COVID uh, and any po potential surges going forward. Number 16 is inaugurate operationalized as a regular practice, the executive, uh, the executive patient safety leadership walk rounds to all various patient care and non-patient care units. And then number 18 is continue the collaborative working relationships with the executive and legislative leaders to appropriate the funding for capital improvement plans and critical facilities and infrastructure plans. Uh, relative to this year's uh, milestones, uh, the first uh, milestone that we were hoping to achieve was by the end of uh, this past January, we were striving for 90% uh, uh, vaccination of our hospital staff. Uh, we didn't uh, meet that milestone, but uh, today uh, we're happy to say that we, we, we're up to 77%. And uh, hopefully by the end of March, we will have achieved uh, 90%. And uh, so we will keep on trying to achieve that until we get there, if not higher. By no November 2021, GMHA will launch the new and more effective and efficient electronic health record uh, electronic medical record system with a high interoperability capability throughout the hospital's clinical and non-clinical services. Number three, uh, we will achieve a reduction of the uh, RN vacancy rate to 5%, thereby increasing our bed capacity uh, throughout all the inpatient care units by, by December of this, this year. Uh, and by the end of the calendar year, we will achieve a cumulative collection rate of 75% from payers. Next, I'm going to uh, turn it over to uh, one of our clinicians, uh, uh, Dr. Dr. Ogden, and uh, she's going to start get, giving us, giving you all a COVID-19 update. Okay, so GMHA has taken care of over 1,100 patients. Currently, our census is five COVID patients with two patients uh, or two persons under investigation. 
Our total COVID emergency department discharges are roughly 373. Our total hospitalizations for COVID are 759. Our COVID discharges are about 88% at 668. And total COVID deaths are 88 with eight dead on arrival. The creation of the COVID beds, we've created 125 COVID beds um, in seven different care areas, six of which are located at Guam Memorial Hospital, and the seventh is the uh, COVID isolation facility, the SNF in Barbara Heights. GMHA has served as a major resource for several other government agencies in their infection control and prevention efforts. Supplying staffing uh, for decontamination as well as training for those efforts, personal protective equipment, laundry services. We have also worked very closely with Guam Fire Department to ensure the safety of the EMS staff for the delivery of patient care as well as protection for their staff. So I have for the COVID-19 update. I'm going to pass it now on to our CFO, Yuka Kachanova. This is Yuka. So I'm gonna just talk a little bit about what the fiscal division, um, uh, what the, the departments that are under the fiscal division. So the first one is the patient registration, which is the front end of the revenue cycle. And this is usually the first encounter that the patients have at the hospital. We also have medical records, which is the recording and preservation of the medical information because we are required to maintain a complete medical record for each patient. Patient affairs is also known as the business office and houses the patient billings and collection function. We prepare the bills, clean the bills, uh, deal with denials and also collect from the insurance and patients themselves. And also the accounting department is responsible for the financial reporting and the reporting. So that involves cash management, accounts payable, payroll, budget, and the charge master. We're also involved in the uh, annual financial audit, the Medicare cost report, report, our annual budget, and now we also have a uh, responsibility for CARES funds reporting. So our current financial posture. The CARES funds that we received to date include $9.7 million from the provider relief funds from the um, Department of Health and Human Services. That was directly provided to GMH. We also received $6.1 million from um, the government of Guam for COVID-related uh, differential pay and also for hiring COVID physicians. And 1.5 million was also paid to us for um, ready kits for the central monitoring uh, system equipment. We also received 4.5 million from uh, Medicare as an advance at the beginning of the pandemic. Uh, it, this was Medicare CMS's efforts to immediately infuse cash into um, the hospitals, directly to the hospitals. But this is an advance and we will have to begin paying this back in April and this will just come uh, out of the remittances from CMS for Medicare patients and they will start to withhold unless they change any provision through legislation that um, we will get to keep it as a, as a grant fund report. But we haven't heard anything yet. Uh, for 2021 appropriations, we have been uh, on track with receiving appropriations. We have 9.2 million we've already received. We're pending uh, some amounts for January, but for February, uh, for FY 2020, we're still pending uh, $1.1 million from the pharmaceutical fund. And because the collections for the um, pharmaceutical fund were a little short last year, uh, there, the likelihood of us receiving that is very low. So for financials, uh, as of January 31, just to give you an overview of we, where we are currently, our gross revenues compared to the same time last year are about one and a half million dollars lower, and our collections are only about half a million dollars lower. So this is... Um, even with our lower census, we've still been able to somewhat maintain our gross revenues. We did have a, 
a pretty hard hit when COVID hit. So from April all the way till September, um, our revenues were reduced quite substantially because of the amount of patients we were not seeing anymore. And also um, the elective surgeries were all put on hold. Our operating expenses, however, have increased significantly. We've had a lot of expenses incurred because of COVID. We've had to pay more for personnel. Um, more, we hired more people to be nurses and housekeepers and security just to deal with COVID. We had differential pay. We hired travel nurses. We hired physicians. Um, we had to obtain special medications and, of course, lots of PPE. And this, because the expenses have been so much higher, although our revenues have been pretty steady, it has affected our cash because we have a lot of vendors to pay because of the increase in, in the amount of expenses. One of the things that will help our cash is when we receive um, the reimbursement from FEMA for the travel nurses. So that whole project is on the verge of being approved, and then we should start receiving the reimbursements now. So for fiscal, our goal of achieving financial stability, we have done several things and we have several things in the works. Uh, as mentioned earlier, we're um, procuring uh, consulting services for revenue cycle management. And this will really help us with um, reducing receivables and of course, maximizing our collection and ultimately improving the patient's experiences. We're also procuring a bill scrubber, which is a uh, software so that we can submit cleaner claims and again, receive payments uh, a lot faster. We still work with the Department of Revenue and Taxation for garnishments of um, tax refunds. And we are also getting assistance from the Attorney General's Office uh, for collections. And we also started um, a self-pay task force to assist the self-pay patients to get public assistance. So when we see a patient that is self-pay, we have the assistance of even the social workers to prepare, um, to, to give them the application for uh, Medicaid or other public assistance and help them follow through with the application. We've also been addressing, of course, our financial audit findings relative to the revenue cycle management processes, which is mainly with receivables. And we continue to strengthen our relationships with our insurance companies. So during COVID, we didn't meet with them as often as we should, but we started to pick up our meetings again with all the insurance um, carriers so we can maintain that relationship and get the payments when they are due. So I'll turn it over to Janelle. Janelle, are you still there? Yes, I am. This is Danielle Mangloni. I'm the, the Administrator for Quality, Patient Safety, and Regulatory Compliance. Next slide, please. So the hospital is currently, currently maintains its CMS certification. Our last full recertification survey was in April 2018. Our last validation survey was January 2020, and because CMS had placed limitations on their on-site survey, we did have a telephone survey with them May 1st of last year. Um, for our Joint Commission accreditation, we had actually uh, had a full denial back in 2018 on July 17th. If you wanted more information and the details of that, I put a um, link that you're able to go and uh, see the full report there. Next slide, please. So our CMS certification covers our acute hospital here. It also covers the skilled nursing facility, which was last surveyed January, 2019. And its last telephone survey was June, 2020. Um, our respiratory ABG lab is also certified by, by CMS. Um, and its full survey was back in April of 2019. Um, for the telephone conference, or telephone survey back in June for the skilled nursing facility, there was one finding, however, we were able to abate that and it's, it was no longer um, on the final report. For the respiratory ABG lab, they actually had a perfect survey. There were no findings as a result. 
Uh, I will say for the acute care hospital, there are some findings that we continue to work on. Um, they are a work in progress. Um, and if you had questions on those, I can, I can answer them. Um, specific to the citations for the governing board in the past, um, they've been cited on not meeting regularly, um, the development and implementation of full implementation of a POPI program, um, ensuring that full medical staff members had their credentials validated, um, ensuring enforcement of the medical staff bylaws, having an organized nursing service that includes discharge planning, and ensuring patient safety in the radiology services. Um, these have all been um, corrected or resolved. Um, in the eyes of regulatory bodies, as well as accreditors, um, it's the governing body that's ultimately responsible and accountable for safety and quality of care at the hospital. Um, and this responsibility derives from the board's legal responsibility and operational authority for hospital performance. In this context, the governing body provides for internal structures and resources, and the governing body holds ultimate responsibility for the compliance with all Medicare conditions of participation, and when accredited, the hospital accreditation program standards. Now, the board's involvement with safety, quality, and compliance, uh, the way, again, through the eyes of the accreditors and regulators, um, is that they need to have an understanding of the medical staff credentialing process um, and be able to apply that whenever we have candidates come in for privileging, um, as well as appointing them and maintaining credentials here at the hospital. Um, they're also responsible for ensuring the hospital complies with the needs regulatory and legal standards and requirements, and as well as maintaining professional standard of care. Um, they're also responsible for tracking quality indicators to ensure that the quality of care patients receive at the hospital is maintained. Excuse me, Danielle, can I just ask yes. um, who's controlling the slides? Could you please upload a copy onto the chat? Okay. We did not get this in advance, so we weren't able to provide copies to the senators, if that's possible. Okay. To the chat. What chat group is that? The well, just right here on the um, uh, in the Zoom chat. Otherwise, you can send it to us in any way, and we'll put it up here for them. Thank you. Okay. Please proceed, Danielle. Okay, thank you. Um, the board also is responsible for annually evaluating the hospital administrator and for conducting a self-evaluation of them and its, their operations as well to see how well they are functioning as a board and also as participating in the surveys themselves, such as attending the opening or the exit sessions. Um, there's also, the board has oversight. They act as fiduciary. Um, their key task includes evaluating the organization's quality performance. And we have a quality subcommittee that does this. Um, keeping management focused on quality and ensuring that the organization has an effective quality improvement effort. And here we call ours the Quality Assessment and Performance Improvement Program, as well as the medical staff credentialing process. And in this role, the board fun focuses internally and emphasizes what has happened. For leadership, the board acts as a strategic partner with management, and the key task includes identifying the organization's purposes, shaping the organization's agenda, helping management to position the organization in its market, and helping management to prepare the organization for the future. This is where they also focus externally and emphasizes what will happen in the future. And I will turn this over to, I believe, Don Rabinal for the EHR implementation update. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, um, Madam Speaker. This is Don Rabanal, uh, Assistant Administrator for the Admin Services, and I will walk um, everybody through a brief update of our EHR project, uh, which is, by the way, a full remote project that we have started. The project actually kicked off May of 2020, um, and uh, we have started our super user training 
um, by August uh, of 2020. Uh, and we have been uh, building this particular um, solution uh, to, to localize and to customize, it, to customize it according to the requirements of GMH. Uh, unfortunately, it was the same time where the second surge happened, uh, which, the, which uh, meant that we lost uh, most, if not all of our super users at our SMEs. Uh, to operations because of because of patient care uh, being a priority, uh, but the, the good news is uh, we would we are currently scheduled to have the first on-site visit of our partners uh, from Medsphere uh, by the fifteenth of March, uh, and we have uh, we're we're fortunate enough uh, to have uh, commitments from operations to free up the thirty-seven or so SMEs so that they could attend back-to-back uh, -back weekly um back to back full week sessions one remote um which would be led internally by the by the project team and then on site training by our um consultants from medsphere um our current uh, our initial uh, target go live dates um tar initial target go live date prior to covid when we kicked it off uh, was may uh, of 2021 um again because of uh, the, the the unfortunate delays um, that we have experienced um, and the inclusion of a uh, of the necessary upgrade of the laboratory information system that we kicked off just this January. Uh, our current adjusted target go live date is October of 2021. Um, so which which makes it uh, currently as uh, with that particular schedule is an 18 month target, which is usually um usual um project timeline uh for an ehr upgrade would be about 12 to 18 months so we're we're still in uh, right around that corner um while while covid was going on um the, the team actually pivoted as well and, and implemented some telemedicine solutions from outpatient services which we launched in september which enabled um, some of our outpatient services to reach out to our patients and because we close our um, outpatient services at the hospital. And uh, that, the tele-ICU, um, telemedicine services that we launched in January um, of this year uh, to be able to provide support uh, for, the, for the massive need of ICU patients that we have at GMH. <clears throat> and so the next slide um, would give us, um, would give, give everybody um, a dashboard of, uh, of the various activities that we have as far as the project is concerned. Uh, the current um, um, completion rate of the project, I believe, is about 34% overall. That is the EHR plus the soft lab or the uh, laboratory information system upgrade. Uh, we are tracking this uh, very carefully. This is a shared tool uh, between the vendor, uh, the various vendors, because they're primarily two or three, um, and of course, the project team at GMH. Again, uh, we thank the operations uh, team, the, the, our, our clinicians who are very, very much um, engaged uh, in this particular project, and, uh, and of course, the, the leadership team uh, of GMH in, in supporting this, this critical um, project uh, for the hospital. That's it for my part, and I turn it over to Mr. William Pando. Thank you, Don. Uh, this is uh, William Kando again, Associate Administrator of Operations. Uh, uh, next, I'm going to be I'm going to take you through uh, a few slides on our capital infrastructure to give you an update on how we're coming along on that, uh, especially as it is a lot as these are aligned and guided by our Army Corps of Engineers assessment that had been uh, completed by the Corps uh, in uh, November of 2019. Recent completed projects: uh, Phase One implementation of the Pixis. This is the uh, automated pharmaceuticals uh, 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 dis distribution dis dispensing uh, machines that uh, we've been we've been putting into the hospital uh, throughout the hospital. Uh, we first started in, in the OB ward, L and D, urgent care, and medical surgical, and these were completed in September of 2019. Phase two was uh, was for 21 other nursing units. Uh, we we completed 14 of 20 of those 21 completed in 2020. And then phase three is uh, is to complete those that were are, are remaining, plus in a, some additional areas such as radiology and the SNF. So those are ongoing. So this project is well on its way uh, to full completion, but we have completed uh, uh, quite a bit of it. Uh, I would say the majority of it has been completed. 
in addition to the care units, to the COVID care units. The COVID care area. units, we added the COVID care units as well. Uh, we modernized our hospital uh, vertical elevators, number one and number two. And both in March and May of 2020, uh, we repaired uh, boiler number two in May of 2020. Uh, COVID care units three and four electrical and mechanical upgrades was completed by, led by the Army Corps of Engineers. This was a FEMA approved project. And uh, so the Army Corps had other contractors and subcontractors that helped us complete that upgrade. Those upgrades in uh, October of uh, 2020 that uh, gave us, uh, these were focused on our COVID care units. So that gave us uh, quite a bit of uh, additional uh, negative pressure uh, capabilities. Uh, uh, in our care units three and four, and also um, uh, electrical upgrades that allowed us uh, to do uh, hemodialysis and reverse osmosis in quite a quite an additional number of rooms, so that we could go uh, bedside with hemodialysis in our COVID care units uh, three and four. So that was that was a very successful project, valued at about three quarters of a million dollars. Uh, also part of COVID, uh, but also aligned uh, with the Army Corps report uh, because the, the core assessment called out that, that we really had quite a bit of uh, medical equipment that uh, we needed to catch up on as far as procuring and, and modernizing the hospital. So we had the, these uh, ready kits, rapid uh, uh, equipment deployment initiative uh, under uh, Phillips uh, Medical, uh, which, is, which is one of our vendors anyways, uh, uh, that we've, we've standardized uh, telemetry monitoring through Philips Medical. And so during COVID, uh, they had this ready kit. Uh, these are 20, 20 telemetry systems per kit. And so we've procured uh, six kits. Uh, we've actually installed and commissioned four of six. And so, so I've listed there for you what we completed basically uh, in September through December. Uh, we have completed uh, COVID care unit three, non-COVID care unit tele, COVID uh, care unit six, and surgical were completed in September through December uh, 2020. ED and COVID care units one, two, and five are to be completed uh, March through May uh, of this year. Uh, we recently launched the Rounder 2 tel telemedicine program, launched in February on February 5th, uh, 2021, giving GMHA two, uh, two avenues to provide critical care telemedicine. Uh, we have the Innovator Health Physicians Group, and then also we have contracted independent uh, physicians that are also use, utilizing uh, the, the system so that we can provide uh, critical care telemedicine at GMH. This was a huge improvement uh, for us, and, and we, we, uh, we were led by the efforts of uh, Dr. Uggen in making this happen, and her team in, in CCU, ICU, and our, our IT experts we have some very good IT uh, uh, subject matter experts that helped us uh, make this happen. And then we had we've completed quite a few um, uh, FF&E uh, purchases during COVID, uh, that some, some related to COVID and some that we were already working on anyways, uh, such as uh, the, the procurement of infusion pumps, BiPAPs, CPAPs, high flow nasal cannulas, vital sign monitors, hospital beds. We recently just got 40 hospital beds that we had been waiting on for some time, uh, CT scanner injectors, fetal monitors, portable uh, HEPA air filtration systems, uh, even a laboratory pathology grossing station that uh, that they had been laboratory had been waiting on for quite some time. So we were happy to bring that in, and our staff our staff actually had to be the ones that to install it and commission it. This is a system that is normally done by an outside contractor, but because of COVID, we didn't have the luxury of uh, of having a contractor come in. So our, our facilities maintenance crew actually did that themselves. The next slide is uh, capital improvement projects uh, in progress or in the pipeline. Uh, the, main, the main electrical distribution uh, panel and subpanels are things that we, with our relationship with uh, GPA, we're, we're maintaining. We're not actually replacing it. We're planning to maintain it uh, so that uh, we, we can save that money for the new hospital. Uh, so each year since 2018, uh, GPA has, we've collaborated with GPA and, and they've come in and inspected and as, uh, assessed our, our main panel and they're helping us to maintain it and, and replace mechanical parts, electrical parts to keep that uh, system going. And uh, 
So we're really appreciative of uh, that relationship with the GPA. We have uh, HVAC system upgrades that are that are going on because uh, we've only replaced uh, two out of 64 AHUs. Uh, so we have uh, 62 to go. We're about to go advertise for a set of about 10 of, the, uh, 10 of them. And so we're gonna be doing this in phases. Um, we've also designed uh, HVAC upgrades for our OR. Uh, we're designing for our ED and ICU for HVAC negative pressure and other improvements in the ED and ICU and radiology department as well. And so those designs are in progress. Uh, the design for the OR is already completed and we're trying to pull uh, DOI funds that are have been pending for about a year now uh, that was almost, uh, re almost ready to come to us, but uh, it had to go through the NEPA process, uh, Army Corps of Engineers, uh, and it got stuck during COVID. And so we're working with a, uh, a new representative that we was introduced to us uh, last night, Dung Cho. His name is Dung Cho. And uh, so we're collaborating with him. Uh, he wanted to know what we need uh, relative to DOI OIA funds. And so we, we let him know that about that particular uh, grant that's pending. And then we're going to be meeting with him uh, relative to our other needs as well, uh, relative to grant funds potentially coming to the GMH. Uh, we need to resolicit for our 1.6 meg uh, gen set. Uh, so we're, gonna, we're preparing that for resolicitation. Uh, we're, we're going to be assessing and repairing boiler number one now uh, to make sure that we, we, we retain a redundancy on, on those boilers uh, because they're, they're just, they provide critical service to GMH. We, we, we provide steam to our autoclave, to our, we provide it for steam sterilization, and we provide it to heat our water for hot water throughout the hospital. Uh, we're, we're about to let out a, an RFP for design for the hospital roof and envelope upgrade project. So we'll be, we'll be letting that out shortly, but that's, that'll be for the design phase. Uh, we're nearly completed with uh, about, a, we're about a week away from completing the communication center relocation project. Uh, and so they would be the last, actually the last folks that would be leaving the, uh, the Z-Wing, which is fairly abandoned. Uh, uh, which, in which case we're designing for re to retrofit the Z-Wing. Uh, we were looking at possibly demolishing it, but uh, it, it, we're looking at the possibility of actually retrofitting it and salvaging it because we have a, we have a significant space. space issue at GMH that we need to address. And so we've already had a structural engineer go into the facility and they're telling us that, yes, it is very, very possible. And could be cost uh, cost effective, more cost effective to salvage it. And so we're exploring that and we'll be presenting that to uh, the executive leadership team and the board uh, in the coming uh, month, within, within the month of March, we'll, we'll, we'll know where we're going for, for, for that project. We have, uh, we have and continue to do information technology upgrades uh, that, would, that would help us to make sure that uh, as we implement the EHR, our, our IT system infrastructure throughout the hospital is, is on solid ground. And so these are very important upgrades that we've been doing this past year and we continue to do this year. And then we, we continue to buy the various medical equipment uh, that we need in the hospital as we can afford it. Uh, so funding is, is still an issue for us, uh, but uh, some things we just cannot wait to procure. So we, we, do, we do what we need to do. And then we need to replace our fleet of uh, vehicles. So that is in our FY22 budget as well. The next slide that uh, we, uh, we are, we are looking forward to the working with the, the Guam uh, task force uh, for, for building the new GMH uh, hospital facility. Uh, so we look forward to uh, the first set of meetings that will be taking place soon uh, relative to the, the, this, uh, this project. And so that we can get into the design concept phase, followed by the AD design service phase, followed by construction. And so we look forward to, to hearing and, and working collaboratively with this, uh, with this team. Uh, also, uh, we needed you to know that uh, 
we were very happy and excited about the FEMA approval of a $15 million uh, public assistance improvement project at our skilled nursing facility as a result of COVID. This is called our, our alternate care facility. And so the ratio is 75-25. Uh, uh, so we, they actually obligated 11 and a half million for GMH, uh, but this may actually go to 100%. And so we continue to work with FEMA on this one. This is to, to develop at the SNF uh, a medical pandemic isolation facility. And it, the scope of work involves uh, HVAC system upgrade, negative pressure, and medical capabilities upgrades. Uh, and it includes a bed capacity of uh, 54 uh, beds to include uh, four ICU beds, two ICU step-down beds, four single certified isolation room beds, 44 acute care beds, inclusive of eight beds with uh, hemodialysis capability and various professional support service upgrades uh, to include possibly a CT scanner space, a portable x-ray machine, ultrasound, echo, EKG, EEG, and PFT to, to just name a few. And so uh, uh, we will we'll be getting into the design phase on this project. We're already kind of into it because uh, we, we're already isolating the this three wings, A, B, and C wing. We've been isolating, we're, we're trying to isolate the B wing and we're almost done with the design phase on this because we wanna bring the skilled nursing facility residents from Catholic Social Services back to the skilled nursing facility uh, as soon as possible. And so in working with FEMA, they this additional scope, they approved it, it under the grant program. So. They said that we could we would be approved for reimbursement uh, at the closeout of this project, and it would be it's approved for inclusion. So, this, this is Lillian. Just to clarify, that building uh, the that we call it skilled nursing facility, it will still function as a facility to house the skilled nursing unit residents. Uh, as a long-term care, uh, you know, that we need to provide. But if in the event we have another pandemic, another situation such as this COVID, um, we can then just turn on the switch. Once we complete the construction and the renovation, we can turn on the switch, move the patients, the SNU residents out of there, turn on the switch to then make it a, a isolation facility. Uh, and so that's the plan for that building. And also, so the you you know that we are we are operating on a portable chiller over there. I know you're aware of that. Uh, we were trying to replace our chiller. Uh, we recently uh, we had issues with this procurement, and so working with the AG's office, uh, we we came to a decision to go ahead and cancel the uh, the bid, uh, and in our best interest, in the best interest of the Guam community. And the good news is the chiller, the air handling units, the entire, really a, almost the entire HVAC system is a part of the scope for this alternate care facility. So this is really, we're, we're basically sending it back through design, which is why we needed to cancel it to reassess, you know, because we're gonna be putting negative pressure into all the rooms. And so we need to make sure we get this right. And so that's why we, we canceled it and it will be federally funded. And so that's really good news. That's the conclusion of our presentation. Uh, so we are available to answer any questions that you have. I'm sure you do because we've given you quite a bit of information. Uh, and, you know, we've uh, probably talked your ears out in terms of where we are right now with our hospital and what direction we're moving forward. So we're available. We're here to answer whatever questions you have. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, Administrator Posadas, and thank you all for the presentation. It was it was very thorough. Um, very happy to again be hearing the updates on on the CMS, um, you know, reviews on the um, patient care, of course, the finances and the CIP projects. We had quite a bit of oversight hearings uh, in the last term until COVID came, and then I didn't want to really bother the hospital with you know, having to come down to the legislature or, or do anything. Uh, so I'm so very happy to have you back on Zoom here. And uh, I hope we can be doing this regularly uh, moving forward. So some of the projects, as I'm sure some of uh, my colleagues, even the new ones, they've probably been following along uh, that, uh, you know, these are longstanding projects. They were all urgent and, and um, uh 
yeah, it's, I guess it's mixed, right? We're kind of, I wish they were done already, but I'm glad to hear that there's some progress on it. And I hope that we can say they are done in the next few months that uh, especially the roof project that you're moving forward on finally, that the um, the EHR was, was very urgent. Uh, when we were arguing for the $10 million in CIP to go to the hospital, it was very urgent according to CMS. So I'm glad that that's finally going to be implemented. And the, um, of course, electrical panel, the, the HVAC, all these issues. So um, I'm glad for the very thorough presentation and um, the, I'm, I'm glad that you were able last night to approve uh, some nursing retention policies, including an increase to 20%. And so I'm very glad that you've been able to take care of that in-house. So we've been talking about nursing retention for, for several years and um, knowing that, and GMH has, has made its own efforts to try to retain nurses there at the hospital as a priority. And so I'm just glad that you were able to do that. Uh, um, Last night, I, I wish you had mentioned that at the hearing yesterday, because uh, if you're able to do it in house, then, you know, we can shift that money somewhere else. But uh, I'm just, I'm just very glad and I'd like to see if you have any the retention plans that you are outlining if you could yeah send uh, anything else that you've got in mind over and uh, I know I talked to Dr. Berdalio yesterday about, you know, some of the other issues that might require legislative attention and so we'll just continue to work together. But I'm going to open it up now to my colleagues, um, beginning with my vice chair, Senator Perez. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you to all the GMH uh, staff and um, the trustees as well. Um, it seems like you were able to clone yourself, um, you know, just joking really, but it seems like you've, you've actually, um, you know, didn't stop. Uh, you didn't miss a beat during COVID because I remember the last um, informational hearing, or I think this is during the budget time. Um, I, I remember, uh, I, you know, I could see the progress from that time as far as collections and all these procurements that are, have gone through. And, you know, I do recognize the, the, the progress and I do thank you for all your hard work in, in, in doing this. Um, yeah, I just want to clarify a couple of things. I hope I'm not gonna belabor this, but uh, as far as the operating expenses, uh, so this question is for Yuka. Uh, regarding the operating expenses, um, you mentioned it increased and that potential, there's a potential for FEMA reimbursement for travel nurses. Um, what portion of the, um, so as I'm looking at the table here, um, there was a 60 million versus the 44 million uh, around this time last year. Um, what percentage of that do you, would you uh, estimate to be reimbursable? Uh, this increase in operating expenses, how much of that would be covered um, by federal funds? The, specifically for the travel nurses, we're looking at about, we the project is valued at $10 million. So at the time when we ran these figures at January, I believe we were at about 5 million with the nurses, five or 6 million already. So that is supposed to be covered 100% uh, by FEMA. Okay, so there's a, the difference of like about, I would say almost uh, 20, 20 million. So 10 million is gonna be covered by FEMA. Uh, what about the other, um, the, the, the other? other the other expenses are going to be covered through the provider relief fund, which is the money that we got directly from health and human services. Mm -hmm. So we, we presented in our operating expenses, but on our financial statement, the, the, offset or the money that came in is shown um, below the line. So it, it should offset, but in this case, it's not. But the rest of the money is coming from the provider relief fund, the nine, the 9 .1 million that we got from Health and Human Services. Okay, thank you for that response. Uh, I guess the, the other question that I have, uh, maybe, maybe for compliance. So I just wanna make sure I heard this correctly. Um, so what is the status of accreditation, Danielle? Hi, this is Danielle. Um, we are currently not accredited by Joint Commission. We are certified by Medicare. Okay. 
Um, and then in your presentation, um, so a lot of the efforts that was done by GMH is, is a lot of these um, efforts to uh, address uh, some of the, the issues? Yes. Okay. And um, is there like a, another, I guess, conversation in regards to, um, you know, renewing accreditation or what, what is the, the timeline or the steps towards that? Well, there have been discussions um, about reapplying for accreditation. Um, I did provide the board as well as executive management uh, presentation on the various accreditation bodies that are out there. Joint Commission is not the only one. Um, some of the other ones besides Joint Commission, their standards align more closely with that of Medicare, whereas Joint Commission, there are a lot of um, ones that go beyond just those required of uh, Medicare. Um, so we looked at pros and cons. Uh, there still needs to be more discussion on that. Um, if the decision is to press forward for accreditation, then um, we would move forward with that. Okay. Um, to what extent is the, um, the facilities a big part of um, accreditation? A large part because they all have um, expectations reg regarding what is called the physical environment as well as life safety code compliance, which deals with um, life safety for, uh, sorry, against fire. Okay. All right. And I know there's talks of, uh, you know, rebuilding a new hospital. Um, is there any updates on that one? Uh, this question could be for uh, Mr. Kando. Yes, uh, Lillian and I are both uh, working. Uh, we're part. We're members, and there's, there's several of, of us that are going to be members of, of Team Guam, including some of our board members, uh, like our board uh, our board member uh, Sharon Davis, uh, who chairs our facility CIPIT uh, subcommittee. And so we'll be collaborating closely with uh, Gita. We'll be leading the team, and and bringing us together and and setting up the first set of meetings. And so we're we're hearing now that those are going to roll out very soon. So we'll we'll know more on that very soon. Okay, thank you. And I did hear, you know, there was some talks about using compact impact funds to fund the hospital. Um, what is your understanding of potential sources of revenue to, to help rebuild the hospital or build a new hospital? Well, first, we, uh, there was an application uh, to the Office of Adjustment, Economic Adjustment, um, in terms of getting some grant fund for the conceptual part of it. Uh, you know, we don't know yet what funds are going to be available to build the new hospital because, you know, we need to at least talk about the, the conceptual part of it, how big this hospital is going to be, you know, and, and the estimated cost. So no funds have been identified that I know of, uh, that I've been informed. Okay, thank you, um, Minister. All right, thank you, uh, Madam Chair and Madam Speaker. Thank you, Senator. Senator Taitigui, you are recognized. Siju Smasi, Madam Chair and Madam Speaker. Uh, thank you everyone uh, for being here today and providing this uh, very good presentation. Uh, I was hoping to have it beforehand. I'd probably have more questions, but sometimes that's a strategic play. <laughs> but anyways, I'm just very happy on, on, on what is going on right now at, at the hospital. Um, and uh, most especially the um, bill that created the task force that's coming into play. It's been long overdue. We've been waiting for that for a while. So uh, I'm glad to see it was part of your presentation and it wasn't left behind. Um, the only question, uh, my good colleague, Senator Paris had all my questions said, <laughs> thank you for that. Cause it was, um, that was taken care of and to move things along. Uh, the only thing I have is what funding are you setting aside for the maintenance moving forward of the current hospital? Um, I know you have all these upgrades that, that you wanna do all these projects, but what about the um, maintenance, You know, just the day, day to day? Um, how are you doing as far as uh, setting those fundings aside? We, uh, this is William. Uh, thank you for that question, uh, Senator uh, Taitabi. Uh, we we include this uh, the maintenance budget every year in our annual budget. This is this is very important. We don't 
we don't forget that. Uh, and so uh, our facilities maintenance manager, uh, Zaldi Tigotti, uh, budget, budgets for it. Uh, and uh, cash flow is, is not always there, but it, we always make that a priority. We don't, uh, you know, we just, uh, given our age and our systems, we just can't, we cannot uh, forget that. And so uh, we include it. This is separate and apart from all the other, you know, the like the electrical panel, the monitor upgrades, the um, other the elevators. That's separate and apart, correct? You are separating in that. Yes, yes, we have we have an entire preventive maintenance uh, program that we that we are required to maintain uh, every day, every week. Uh, these these guys are performing prevent preventative maintenance. Uh, we did get. Uh, you know, COVID, uh, we did get a little behind on our uh, less critical pieces of equipment. Uh, all of our, we maintain 100% of all of our, the maintenance on all of our critical life, life-saving, patient safety-saving equipment. But uh, some of our less, less important did, uh, did take a backseat during, during the height of COVID. And now we're catching up on all of that because uh, CMS uh, will be looking at that. Okay, thank you so much. Yes, they will. And uh, my last question would have to be, there was, there was comments made by the traveling nurses that visited uh, GMH. And it was, uh, some of the comments were disheartening, um, but it did mention the issue with the molding, the mold that's there. What have you done to address this issue? Well, we're having, we're having to, uh, until we're <clears throat> able to address it <clears throat> through our roof uh, upgrade and our envelope, which is our doors, uh, like windows, uh, walls. We're about to launch the design phase of that. So when we do the roof, it, we're doing the whole envelope as well. And so uh, until we until we get this project done, we're having to we're having to replace ceiling tiles as they get wet. Uh, we're having to clean the walls. We're having to clean uh, uh, grids. You know that that uh, hold up the ceiling tiles. Uh, CMS is looking at it, and so. We we actually had to develop a schedule to to hit certain areas that are that tend to be uh, prone to that sort of thing, uh, and it's not just leaks from rain. It's also um, it's also related to our ventilation system uh, condensation that's generated from our ventilation system because uh, because these are these are old air air handling units, and so that also causes the the moisture on these ceiling tiles. And so we're having to address it every every week, every day we go, we we we, we do fix it. it. It's not very cost effective when when the when you have a situation like that, but it kind of is what it is until we fix the the roof, and and the envelope. Well, I I think it's most important for the safety and welfare of not just the patients but the staff who are there all the time. You know, working day in and day out. It's very important to keep them safe. So I really appreciate uh, you staying on top of this. And uh, thank you so much for the opportunity, Madam Speaker. And thank you everyone who's here today, as well as the trustees. Thank you. Thank you. Um, if I could also just clarify something with Yuka on the, fin the financial stability presentation that you made. Um, you talked about you know, increasing, uh, you've got a consultant, you're going to be increasing collections, better billing, uh, Throughout this presentation, they've talked about grant funding that you are pursuing for, for CIS projects and other projects. And we have, um, you know, of course, partnerships with the AG. And so the, the proposed budget for, um, from the general fund for the hospital for FY22 is, is pretty much zero, except for the pharmaceutical fund. And I, I just want to know, so this, this, this plan takes that into account, that's correct? Yes, because the whole plan with improving revenue cycle is to really to really just to get better cash flow into the hospital. So we we have so many patients and we bill, um, we don't always collect on all the billings. And so a lot of it has to do with um, the processes that we have. Uh, and um, we believe that having the consultant on board will help bring in additional revenues um, in the form of cash to help with uh, the shortfalls in the budget. And also we can pursue some federal opportunities as well, federal grants. All right. That's what we're being told is that uh, those places that were not funded in the budget are 
uh, going to be using federal money, so we're not supposed to worry about them. Uh, but okay, I just wanted to make sure that that was the case. All right, thank you. So we now have um, Senator Senator Duenas. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker, and to the Board of Trustees and the management uh, uh, staff there. Uh, very thorough presentation, and I appreciate uh, all the updates. Uh, I have sense many questions were asked on some of the specifics. Um, I know that the working group coming together will be discussing, of course, as you as you talked about the, the new hospital facility. Uh, there's been questions about funding. I'm wondering, have you explored uh, the idea or is it on the table to explore the idea of leaseback potential, much like the uh, school DOE school systems has done uh, with some of the uh, the schools? Is, is that on the table in terms of opportunities? That, so, and this is for planning purposes for the legislature going forward to kind of understand um, and working with you uh, how to um, you know be creative and and opportunities for funding. Hi, this is Lillian. We haven't gotten to that point. Uh, you know, we started meeting a couple of times last uh, year with Agita, but again, we haven't gotten to that point in terms of funding. We're still in the very, very beginning stage in terms of putting together the task force and looking at the grant for, you know, the conceptual uh, design. But thank you for that a suggestion. We will put that on the agenda as far as, you know, that option. Thank you. Yeah, cause, yeah, I've seen some uh, some models uh, stateside, and they're 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 pretty promising. Uh, and, you know, it really smooths out uh, uh, amortization schedules, and and you know you can you you can design it to where uh, you know what levels of maintenance and what levels of of things that you build in uh, that the that the leaseback uh, you know has and contains, and 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 perhaps that will also be. Uh, something we can work with the governor on, uh, much like the schools, uh, to, to look at some of those funding sources that are, that are reliable, uh, that are coming to Guam, um, you know, to, to offset that. And federal partners also like that uh, when you dedicate a certain funding source and, and uh, opportunities uh, there. So once again, thanks for the thorough presentation. Um, I'm uh, much like other senators, I'll delve into the details uh, uh, more as you've presented uh, to the committee and uh, perhaps on our next meeting or I'll show up to the board meeting uh, uh, maybe in the next month or so and have other questions. But thank you very much for all the work that you're doing, particularly uh, with COVID, amazing results and, and, and keep up the great work. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. As of today, the, the Zoom meetings are being held by, I mean, the board meetings are being held by Zoom. So it's very convenient for you to attend. All right, we'll continue with Senator Ada. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, Madam Speaker. Uh, perhaps, you know, uh, Lillian on the, I'm not sure how far you guys got, and I know you guys are just on the initial stages of it on the new hospital. Um, was there any discussion as to, I mean, I know the governor came out and spoke about a location that, you know, potentially looking at leasing it from the military to property. Has any other location been discussed on this new hospital? Um, when we first talked about it, uh, what the governor shared with us and in, in the March 2019 uh, meeting with the board, when, she, when the governor came to meet with the board and, you know, what her decision is, is, is to build a new hospital. There were three um, properties that the military had offered the governor that they will be returning to the government of Guam. And one of them, uh, the, the three properties were um, South Finnegan. The other one was somewhere down in Nimitz Hill in the Southern end, the air, end of the island. And then the third uh, property was the uh, Tijan Field in the Manila area. So it's looking like that's possibly the, um, the site which I think is great because it's in the middle part of the island and it's, you know, it's very convenient for the Southern um, people of, the, of Guam. So, but it's not yet finalized. Uh, it's all still in discussion. Mm -hmm. I see. Well, that's great to hear that, you know, we're, we're looking at uh, a new facility. On the, on the uh, you know, I'm just going to go jump around a little bit here. So I hope you guys will just bear with me. I know uh, Bill spoke of William spoke about the the PPEs. 
Um, how, how's your get, how's your supply there of PPEs for, you know, the nurses and the staff or, you know, your, your current, um, I guess, stock on, on PPEs? Well, it's, it's, uh, thank you, Senator, uh, for that question. Uh, we're doing very well. Uh, as a matter of fact, we're doing so well that we're able to give uh, give it sure. a lot of our share our, our, a lot of it to our our emergency partners, uh, such as uh, right now we're supporting the Gung's uh, vaccination program at UOG. We've uh, we we always take care of our our brothers in uh, EMS yeah. GFD. Uh, so at DOC, we take care of them, uh, but quite a few others uh, that we've helped. Uh, but uh, we're maintaining, uh, in the height of COVID, uh, our burn rate uh, mm -hmm. for this for these supplies was starting to get really, uh, really scary uh, because it was it was getting a lot of it was less than thirty days. Some of it, some of it was, some of it was like two weeks, seven days. When the census was high. When the census was very high, and we're and at that time we were also giving out, we were supporting the, the entire team Guam in this response. Uh, what we normally uh, try to maintain is three months, and and so that's that's how that's how that's why that's why we're so nervous and and you know this is this is we're we're protecting our workforce through these PPEs and and, and we have to do that, but we have never we have never run out of PPEs during this entire COVID response. I think Dr. Dr. Badayo and Dr. Elkin both want to say something. I think uh, another area was that all of the doctors and the community came together quite quickly. So we mm -hmm. got quite mm -hmm. a few donations of different uh, PPEs. So, so that was also quite helpful at the very start of it. And then, of course, our, our supply um, materials management people are just very um, on top of it. So that, that really helped a lot too. One of the, um, and this is uh, Jolene again, one of the uh, largest impacts on our PPE supply is the fact that our hospital as well as Guam Fire Department were trained in crisis mode from the very beginning. So we learned how to conserve PPE in crisis standards. And we continue at Guam Memorial to, to use crisis standards because we are remaining vigilant uh, with the community opening up to ensure that we still have supply should our numbers go up. And we were really, we were really proud of the fact that we were really leading the, the fit testing for the N95 masks. I mean, we had, to, we had to not only fit test all of our folks internally in this hospital, but we were taking care of others. And so we, we've been leading the fight uh, and, uh, and we've been leading the team effort. That's great to hear, you know, and uh, that leads me to my next question at 77% of your staff has already been vaccinated. Um, the remaining uh, staff that hasn't, when do you anticipate that all coming to at least hundred uh, percent with those that want to be vaccinated? Well, I, I believe, this is Dr. Berdalio, I believe we're, we're getting pretty close to 100% of those who want to be vaccinated. Mm -hmm. We still have a few, um, and we're vaccinating still once a week. We're, we're getting between 30 and 50 employees that we're, we're doing. Um, but in the beginning, we had so much. I mean, everybody would just wanted to be vaccinated right away. Then we have the population that wants to wait for other people to try it first to make sure that we're okay. So those people have really shown up. And then we do have uh, the, the last group of people who actually are fearful of, of the side effects. So I think we're really working on educating that that population but and then we we have a very small population that just don't want vaccines so so mm -hmm. we try not to um i don't know it's and it's not mandatory uh, so right we try not to force them but we're constantly offering education encouraging. and encouraging them and and a lot of it is we want to get back to normal operations and we know covid's going to be around so we really are encouraging um, and we feel like in the next month or two once we get the new supply of vaccines because again we've had a we we're running out this week 
But once we get that new supply with, that we're expecting at the first week, the end of the first week of March, there'll be another 35,000 uh, vaccines on island. And of course, our, our facility always has enough um, to vaccinate everybody in our facility who wants one. So we should get to that pretty quickly within the next month. Oh, that's great to hear. Thank you, Dr. Medallia, for that. Uh, you know, thank you to the hospital management, the staff, uh, the board of trustees for all the today. So I know it's uh, very critical times up there and, you know, you guys are really pushing forward, but uh, thank you for all that you do. And to uh, Sarah Thomas and uh, Trustee Nedadog, you know, thank you for your opening statements there on where you said you, you know, a closer liaison with the legislature and working together collaboratively moving forward. And I think that's very important because um, working together, I think we can accomplish more and get things more, uh, get more things done instead of trying to bump heads with each other. I think when we see uh, the bigger vision and that's uh, 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 working relationship that, you know, is for the common goal and that's for the good of the island and our people. And I really appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair, Madam Speaker. That's all I have. Thank you, Senator. Senator Bloss, you are recognized. Senator Brown, you are recognized. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. And certainly thank you to all the um, board members and, and key staff of GMH. Um, certainly I'm very pleased to hear about the progress that's been made with regards to the physical infrastructure of the uh, of the hospital uh, in the latter part of 2018, I had the opportunity to um, go up to GMH and, and um, walk through the facility and get feedback and input with regards to the status of where things were. So certainly to see the physical upgrades uh, is very good news. I did wanna ask, cause at the time uh, there was a number of critical equipment, including equipment for the, um, for the operating rooms that uh, in some cases were not operational or in other cases perhaps had already expired their, their recommended lifetime for medical equipment. And I just wanted to uh, be able to get an update on where we are with that. I know some of that might've been put into the presentation, but uh, you know, I, as with my other colleagues, if not, I had a chance to really look at those details for this hearing this afternoon, uh, just having the presentation provided. But I did want to inquire, where are we with regards to that? Because back then, um, we could not have all the operating rooms uh, being used if there was a need to do so uh, because of the equipment issue. So I just wanted to get some feedback uh, with regards to that question. Um, Senator Brown, this is Annie Berdalio. We um, have been one room down in the operating room and a lot of that is again, more the ventilation system. It wasn't, it's not the equipment. So again, we have redesigned the ventilation system and then having to replace the air handling units because those operating rooms uh, require a certain humidity because of the sterility of, of, of the supplies mostly. Um, in terms of equipment, um, well, then COVID hit. So, yes. you know, there's always a piece of equipment that each individual surgeon wants. And again, it's where the, the work is really to prioritize based on usage. So as, as much as my neurosurgeon wants a top of the line something, if he's only going to use it once a year, that kind of goes down the list as opposed to an orthopedic surgeon who might want a piece of equipment that there's three of them and they're used more often. And so some of these issues are prioritizing in terms of what we use more times, what the uh, financial benefits of them are, as well as what also what can be done at the other hospital. So the, and again, it's, it's, a, it's a lot bigger um, kind of examination of, of all of our resources. Um, but, but the other thing that happened is in COVID, we actually canceled all elective surgeries. And so a lot of these, um, these service lines actually really got cut down to basically emergency surgery. So I think in terms of our emergency capability, our equipment is quite um, good. I think Bell Rada is our, has, has uh, fortunately 
uh, procured some extra funding for new angio suite radiology. And in, that includes a C-arm, which is a, an X-ray machine that helps our interventional and our orthopedic surgeries. But we are just coming back to opening up um, to elective surgeries. And again, that the equipment will start to come in um, in terms of the request, but it, it's, it's a little bit of a bigger um, examination because we have to look at what these things, how often these machines are used. And every surgeon comes um, and says, There's, their machine is, we need yesterday. Um, and again, I think we're trying to work with finance and we have our, that's the electronic medical record to sort of, to be able to use data to tell us which pieces are the most critical pieces and which pieces are, are you know, can be, again, just to rank them in order of priority. No, under, understandable. I mean, I, I think we, we can all agree this past year has been quite a, <laughs> an unprecedented year and something I, I know we hope we don't have to go through again, hopefully in our lifetime. So I, I, think, I, I think we can all appreciate that. But again, I, as, you, as you formulate those priority listings, it would be good. I'm sure CMS is also looking at that. But, but it was just a concern certainly I had from that time period because I was looking at a listing of equipment and some that were significantly past their lifespan that were still in use because of course of resources and finances. I think we can all appreciate and understand, you know, the sky's not the limit. Uh, but it, it would be good as you guys make those determinations where we are with regards to the equipment. And, and as, you know, Senator Adder referenced, I, I think we're all looking forward to the, the dialogue with regards to the construction of a new hospital. Uh, I know I've, in my short time back in the legislature, have not had any dialogue with regards to construction of the new hospital. But but if that is to be the case, if that's what the policy decision is going to be, and uh, we collectively decide that this is how we are going to move forward, I hope that we're also including plans. And again, these are things for the future, but to be kept in mind is what will be the use of the existing facility. I mean, of course, uh, all the upgrades that Mr. Kando and his team are putting in place uh, to address for the CMS requirements, also just the physical upgrades and maintenance of the building that's needed. I mean, we know that building was built since the early 70s and, and the challenges that have come with it. Uh, but, but some determination, you know, at some point has to be decided is what will be the future use of the existing GMH? Is it to be demolished, uh, you know, after all this investment and what, what can it be converted to and whether or not the resources are going to be there to fund that? And then also, how can it be properly, um, you know, how do we properly exit out of GMH? Because I had the unfortunate opportunity back when I was at Guam EPA, uh, when we had to deal with, with some issues up at the original GMH at Oka Point, where not a lot of effort at the time, and keep in mind, this was back in the, the early, you know, 1990s. And so we're looking at the exit that happened prior in the 80s of the old GMH, and a lot of effort was not put into an exit plan with regards to just the, not just the infrastructure, the equipment that was included in the old hospital. They didn't properly clear out all the way down to body parts and formaldehyde that were still remaining on the property. Uh, the property was never secured with regards to water or sewer infrastructure. And that's the reason we were there because we ended up having problems with regards to that. So it's a bigger package. I know we always like, you know, it's like buying a new car. You want all the shiny, new, glossy, glossy things, but uh, at the same time, uh, what are we doing? You know, what are our plans and what are we gonna be doing? And I'm sure it's not just something that's, that's on the shoulders of, of the current uh, board and, and those of you in leadership at GMH, but something that collectively needs to be decided. But I just think that issue also needs to be put on the table so that we, we properly address the issue of the existing facility. And then again, um, how do we properly exit so that, you know, things are done in an orderly fashion and we're not left in the situation or the mess unfortunately that the original GMH was left uh, many years you know sitting there before it was eventually eventually demolished so I'm just putting that I'm sure some of you probably thought about it but I think it's an important part of the dialogue that needs to be included in the conversation other than that uh, Madam Speaker I again I appreciate all the efforts of everyone there I, I'm sure they've they've worked very hard to get things to where they are and have done it in spite of the challenges also with juggling uh, taking care of our people during this this past year with with COVID 
And so uh, please, you know, know that your efforts are appreciated. And uh, we literally, you literally have the health and welfare of, you know, our community in your hands. So thank you. I look forward to the continued dialogue and I'm sure we'll, 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 we'll meet again and have these, these discussions. So thank you very much, uh, Madam Speaker, for the opportunity to ask my questions. And, and you, let Madam. me, but, uh, Senator Talahi, let me, let me just say one thing, the, the, the one benefit of the COVID pandemic is the amount of federal government help. So we did, we did get 15 brand new hemodialysis machines um, that, that ours were starting to get to the end of life. So part of, of William uh, Kando's team, and we were able to take advantage of a lot of the federal grant and federal funding under the emergency declaration to replace some of this, uh, these um, medical equipment that, that are, are very costly, but for some reason they came under these um, emergency assistance. So we are replacing, we're gonna get a new, uh, have funding for a CAT scan machine and, a, and, and radiology equipment up at the SNF which we wouldn't usually put that up there. So we're, we're again, taking advantage of the federal dollars that, uh, to upgrade some of this equipment, but then to also make plans to use it um, and not wait for another pandemic. So, so I think there has been some, some small, um, and we've tried to, to replace a lot of this equipment that was at the end of life that met some of our emergency needs, but at the same time, we were, you know, uh, fortunate to, to, to get the funding for. Thank you, Dr. Badani. I'll now recognize Senator Torres. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, GMH, for the, the thorough information. Um, I just had a follow-up question about the um, elective surgeries. Is GMH still a, a COVID designated hospital and are elective surgery still being put off uh, temporarily or is there a, a gradual restoration of elective surgeries at GMH? We are, um, we are restoring as, as a full service um, very shortly. I think again, the operating room, actually it's also patients are really not inclined to come right away. So although our operating room is open, um, we have resumed most of our elective surgeries. We're not limiting it, but we, we do have limitations in staff. I think both hospitals are seeing COVID patients. In fact, we just had a meeting today with the admin people of, of GRMC. And so they have the capability now to take care of COVID patients. And again, because the numbers are low and knock on wood, we're hoping they stay low, where both, both hospitals are trying to get back to normal operations and try to figure out how um, to integrate, to integrate uh, COVID into our normal lives because um, it's not going away. So again, we, 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 we always take care of, of isolation patients. We just didn't have as many all at one time as we did this past year. So we really had to upgrade our facility to handle, you know, a hundred isolation patients at the same time. But now that we're, we're normal hospital operations should handle 10 isolation patients at any one time because we're built to have isolation rooms. We're just not built to have them all come on the same day, day after day after day. So, so I think both hospitals are trying to get back to resuming normal operations. And, and so we're hoping, we're waiting another three weeks because, PC, uh, because the PCOR3 3 just got announced. We know the, the community is opening up and we know that the, the lag is about a three week lag that we're gonna see a, a bump. So we're, we've been delaying that and hopefully by the mid to, to the third week of March, we're going to feel pretty comfortable and start to 
um, again, open up our visiting policies and get back to some, normal. some normalcy. Yeah, thank you. Because I know that that the um, elective surgeries are one factor into the stability, the financial stability of the hospital and the collection of revenues. And that, that was why I asked. And congratulations, by the way, on all the measures that you've taken to achieve uh, greater financial security um, with tackling the billing issues and the accuracy of the billings and and all those things that that you know we've heard in the past have have really led to delays not only in processing uh, but also in in collecting fees from insurance companies. So I'm glad also that the attorney general has been facilitating with GMH and that that's working out. Um, the, the the other question that I had I, I was quite surprised, uh, Mr. Kando, in your discussion about the Z-Wing and and how um, the assessment uh, has has led you to a, a point where you believe that you that retrofitting is an option and not demolition because that that's um, that's a big departure from what I, I understood the condition of that building to be in in prior reports from GMH. Um, so is there, in fact, a, a, a schedule for um, assessing and plans for retrofitting? And if so, what is that timeline? And then where would the uh, funds come for that renovation project? Well, we, the reason we got to this point, uh, actually, um, as we were completing, we we're in the process of completing the, the communication center relocation project, there, there's a telco, there's a telco room of where that, that houses our active uh, communication lines, uh, telephone lines. And it was determined uh, GTA uh, was going to uh, come in and, su and suggest that we uh, reroute them, move them, and then also have to do conduits all the way up to various uh, communication sub panels throughout the hospital. And <clears throat> that was never part of our, uh, vision and plan to, to complete this project and moving these old fragile lines we decided was too risky and so we decided that it would be best to leave the active li lines where they are in the telco room which is in in the just just behind the existing uh, communication center and so the, at, at that time it was determined that we can't we can't demolish that part of the z-wing uh, so we, we, we are working with a current, current uh, design team uh, for Vito Tan Jones uh, to, they were designing for the demolition. We, we, re, we, we quickly brought them back in and said, okay, hey, can you bring in your structural engineers to tell us if, if, these, if this building can be saved, salvaged, because we need the space. And, uh, and we, need to, we need to save this telco room. Uh, and so they came in and, and they, they quickly told us that it can be salvaged structurally by jacketing the, the columns with steel and then pouring concrete. So this building can definitely be made sound and safe for occupancy. And so, so we've got them now transitioning for, to, a, to an assessment to retrofit either half or the entire building and give us give us that assessment as far as cost for each, and the time the time that each of, of, of those could take, and then we're gonna we're gonna look at that internally and present that to the to the board to see what is our best approach going forward. So we're still in the design phase. Only we may be transitioning from demolition to retrofit. But you're not you're not uh, is the building occupied presently, or I mean, is it actually being used? Because I thought that it was vacated. I I got the impression that it was condemned. And not not uh, for you. So the idea that it can be brought back into it, I'm I'm totally confused. Uh, quite honestly, the building was never uh, formally condemned. We evacuated okay. it just to be on we, to err on the side of caution, life safety, and so the the last occupants to leave the building are going to be the communications, uh, the operators in the comp center because of this <laughs> relocation project. So they'll be leaving uh, this coming week. Uh, and uh, so now we can now we have the time to really finish this assessment and determine what is what how can we best use uh, this facility so that uh, it can meet our need and uh, and and best uh, meet the needs of the community to to keep this hospital <clears throat> hospital going 
for the next five to 10 years before we move into a new hospital. Uh, because we evacuated uh, this Z wing, we evacuated over 50 people from this Z wing. It was quite a few, uh, quite oh, a few departments. Most of it was physical services, uh, but uh, there were many other departments. And so now we've basically squeezed into this hospital throughout the hospital. We're stuffed into this hospital like sardines. And 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 I, you know, I, they they come looking for me. Oh, William, can we, we need more space? Looking, we have another person, and I have no more space. And so so, and then we have storage issues. And so, this this is this may turn out to be a, a silver lining if we can save this building and, and make it safe for occupancy. So that's what we're looking at. Okay. Thank you. Um, I, I don't have any further questions right now. Thank you very much, Jim Agent. Thank you for always being available to provide testimony to the legislature. I know that you're so overwhelmed and stretched, but we do appreciate your um, your expert opinion and advice. And um, and we'll pray for you continually. Stuas Maasi. Thank you, ma'am. I need all the prayers. <laughs> Thank you, Senator Torres. I share your surprise about the Z-Wing because uh, it's been on the top of every priority CIP list was demolition, demolition. So, Yeah, and, and you know, uh, Speaker, I, I always thought that it was a matter of concrete falling from the roof. So for it to be safe, um, I, yeah, thank you. Well, we're looking forward to your report. Uh, and uh, we will, uh, can I just ask two more questions? One is... Money owed to GMH from the Department of Corrections, has that been resolved or is there still pending uh, receivable? They just paid up to December, so they're current. Okay, great. All right, so the back pay is done. Okay, what about, uh, Lillian, can you give us an idea about the SNU patients? Will, like when will they be back into the facility or are they there yet or when yeah when do you expect them to be back there or to be accepting long-term care uh, patients okay thank you uh speaker Talai. i thought you were going to ask the next question who else owes gmh <laughs> <laughs> there's a lot <laughs> yeah but well, thank you, thank you so much. on that, so I'm glad. <laughs> thank you. Uh, in terms of the skilled nursing uh, unit patients who are right now temporarily housed uh, at the Catholic Social Services facility, our plan is that, you know, with this PCOR 3, we're monitoring it, that uh, maybe in mid-March, as Dr. Annie Bedalia said, that if the numbers don't uh, rise, we want to bring those patients, those residents back to the skilled nursing facility in Barragata Heights into the A wing, because then the B wing is gonna be worked on uh, with this ACF project. Right now, the, the number of patients that we accommodate as skilled nursing unit uh, residents is 10. And so those 10 individuals, we can move them over to the Barragata Heights facility and continue their care. And we're also gonna need to work with CMS because we requested for a waiver for them to be relocated to a different facility. So we're gonna work with the CMS to see if we can you know, regain, resume the certification um, and not you know, be on this waiver format. So that's the plan is that we will move them um, definitely to a, a more solid facility because that Catholic social services facility right now it's really very, uh, it's a small uh, facility, plus the fact that if in the event we have a typhoon, we that's just going to push us to move them uh, right away because it's uh, there's no capacity capability for us to secure the windows and also to feed those residents if we go into a condition, uh, a typhoon condition one, we won't be able to uh, provide meals to them. So that's definitely going to push us to then move them right away but we're hoping that in the three weeks mid-march we can then safely transition them back to their original home all right thank you thank you thank and you I'll, now i'd like to call on uh, um the acting or the um well he was acting ceo will kando but the ceo lillian Posadas is here now and trustee sonia siliang for the closing by gmh 
Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you, uh, Senators, uh, and the rest of the uh, trustees. Thank you very much for this opportunity. And we, we're really very excited uh, to you know, continue the dialogue and the working relationship. And we are here for whatever you need to uh, bring us down into the legislature or to, again, Zoom and keep you updated with what's going on. And if there's anything else that, uh, you know, is pressing. So thank you very much. Um, and so the rest of our team here, we have a great executive team. I really, you know, just to let you know, I am very, very honored and very like, pleased to have a really great, a fantastic working executive team, as well as our staff uh, who are in the front lines, who are boots on the ground. You know, they've stepped up to the plate. They've, stepped, they've, they've risen to this challenge with the COVID. Um, and so I just want to, to commend and recognize that we have a, a great team here at the hospital and we will continue to, to keep it running, keep it operational so that we can continue to provide the excellent care that the individuals deserve when they come into this hospital. So with that, Mr. Kanda, if you have anything else to say? Just uh, thank you. Thank you for continuing your support of, uh, of this hospital. Uh, we are here until we move into a new hospital. We, we have to hold this fort uh, and, and provide, uh, provide uh, meet our mission, provide safe, quality patient care. And so that's what we do. We come here to the hospital uh, where we, we come with a smile on our face. And uh, we're, it's a pleasure for us to serve, uh, serve you and the Guam community. Uh, we, that's, we love doing what we do. And, and even in, in, during a COVID event like this, uh, we maintain our sense of humor. Yes, and, and 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 it really shows we protect our people, and, and it really shows in the, the the level of care that we provide. And uh, but we we need you to continue to support us, and we really appreciate your support. Thank you. Thank you very much for for the time that you've taken out today, and and the thorough presentation. And I, I I'm sure I speak on behalf of all my colleagues when we say we are committed to the hospital. We are willing to hear. Anything you 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 know need to share with us, we are open to that. You have been very willing and um, you know to do that throughout the year prior to COVID or throughout the years prior to COVID. And I want to thank you for all, all your efforts during during the pandemic and and the emergency response. And as you said, it's not over yet, so we're continuing to monitor that and to wish you the best up there. And uh, again. Um, I think we're all committed. We all want to help you. And uh, while we, uh, we've got at least five years, maybe seven, to build this new hospital, we need to, in the interim, continue patient care. That's the goal. And of course, we want to take care of the staff up at GMH. We want to make sure that um, you have everything you need, equipment, supplies, um, fair compensation, and uh, that um, the government of Guam is, is doing its part to, to take care of patients on Guam. So again, thank you all. Thank you again to my colleagues and, and please take care uh, to the trustees. I'm very honored that you were able to join us all today and for all your work. Thank you so much. Vice Chair, thank you very much. All right, Bye -bye. take care. Uh, this hearing is Thank you.